Uh, hello, my name is Dr. Julia Osman. I'm a history professor at Mississippi State University, and I am here because the Society of the Cincinnati is starting a new initiative to help make more materials available for high school teachers. And so here today I'm going to talk about a couple of things that are uh, important for the national standards uh, for education at the high school level for history. And so this is not uh, a complete account of the American Revolution that I'm presenting by any means. And I talked earlier about the Seven Years' War, and that's not intended, intended to be a complete account of the Seven Years' War either. Rather, what I'm trying to do is hit uh, certain, certain uh, people and certain points and events that are important for the national standards. And since I'm a French historian, uh, the Society of Cincinnati has asked that I talk about certain things that are very important for America as regards to France. And so I've already talked about the Seven Years' War, um, and I've introduced the French into the American Revolution by way of Rochambeau and Lafayette, and how each of them represents kind of a different approach to the American Revolution. Uh, Roche, uh, Rochambeau seems to represent the more diplomatic approach to the French Revolution, and Lafayette seems to embody the more ideological approach to the French Revolution uh, coming from France. And so where I left off in the last lecture, it was kind of with the question of now what? because where I left, left off in the last lecture, Rochambeau was up in Newport, Rhode Island. He had his army with him. His army was finally healthy after a long and, and very difficult sea voyage. Uh, Lafayette had become an important uh, commander in his own right and now had his own troops that he was in charge of, and he had become very important to George Washington and also important for ensuring uh, smooth relations between the French and the Americans during this alliance. And so the question is, okay, wonderful, finally the French have arrived, now what? And of course, on the tip of everyone's mind at this point is probably the Battle of Yorktown. But the Battle of Yorktown didn't just happen. In fact, Washington never planned to have a battle in Yorktown. Washington was really more interested in uh, 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 reobtaining New York. New York had been taken by the British, and Washington really wanted his combined forces with Rochambeau to go and get New York. Rochambeau is the French commander of his French forces, and Rochambeau feels that Virginia would be a better place for the combined armies to attack. But Washington has his heart set on New York, and as Rochambeau is subordinate to General Washington, he is supposed to follow General Washington's orders, Rochambeau is, is ready to accept the fact that they will be attacking New York. However, however, there are some very interesting developments which eventually change George Washington's mind, and they come in the form of a letter from Admiral de Grasse, who is a, a French admiral, and he has his fleet currently in the Caribbean. And I'm going to remind, the, remind everyone at this point that uh, the, the American Revolution, while we think of it as Americans, as, as all about uh, liberating America from Britain, for the French, this was really a world war. And it wasn't quite a world war on the scale of the Seven Years' War, although some French generals thought it should be. But for the French, they were looking at this war as an opportunity um, not just to liberate America, which would be lovely, but um, also to maybe regain some of the things that they had lost to Britain in the earlier Seven Years' War. So the French are interested to see about um, not just independent, not just uh, uh, freeing America, but also what other what other ways could they hurt Britain, or what other things could they reobtain that they lost in the last war. And that explains why you have Admiral de Grasse down in the West Indies. But Admiral de Grasse sends a letter to Rochambeau to say that he is not planning on being in the West Indies from the months of August through October 1781. And this is wonderful news. And, and now I'm going to pause for a moment to talk a little bit about Admiral de Grasse, uh, who is a favorite of the Society of the Cincinnati. Um, Admiral de Grasse was uh, born into a very wealthy family, very wealthy noble family in France. He made his, a, na a very good name for himself at sea. He was an excellent, uh, uh, excellent commander at sea. And we, of course, remember him for his wonderful actions at the Battle of Yorktown, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, but Admiral de Grasse, unfortunately, uh, after the Battle of Yorktown, returned to the West Indies and lost, in a rather embarrassing fashion, in the Saints, which is a part of the Caribbean. And he lost to Admiral Howe, the, the British commander. And for the French, uh, uh, de Grasse was not remembered so much for his wonderful victory at Yorktown, but more for his loss at the Saints. And this was an embarrassing loss for the French Navy. And unfortunately, the, m many of the, of the pictures that even we have of de Grasse um, show him surrendering to Lord Howe. But uh, I, think, I think the more lasting influence, especially considering that we are American today, we are no longer under British authority, this is largely because of the Battle of Yorktown and de Grasse was so important for the Battle of Yorktown, um, it would be very nice if de Grasse's memory could be recalibrated to be more about the Battle of Yorktown, at which he performed beautifully. And so I'm going to show a picture of him right here. This is de Grasse. Um, and not a bad looking man. 
And after, after the American Revolution was over and Rochambeau was presented to the king uh, to receive a, a particular award for having fought so well um, in America, he refused to accept it unless de Grasse was there with him because Rochambeau acknowledged how important de Grasse and the Navy was uh, uh, for this battle. So de Grasse, e even though he might not be the best remembered person uh, in France in the 18th century after the war is over. I'm trying to recalibrate that memory a little bit because he really, with his letter to Rochambeau, he really starts the ball rolling towards what's going to be the most important battle of the American Revolution, Yorktown. So when Admiral de Grasse writes Rochambeau to say, just to let you know, my, my fleet is not going to be in the West Indies, it's going to be in the Chesapeake from the months of August through October in this year, 1781, uh, Rochambeau is very excited and he shows this letter to General Washington. And General Washington sees that, uh, aha, not, you know, that, that they will have the advantage of having the French Navy on their side. Um, if, if they go down to Virginia. And so Washington finally says, okay, Rochambeau, we can go down to Virginia. And so on um, uh, August 18th, I believe, they start to march south, yes. Uh, and so Washington and, and, and Rochambeau start, start, to start their march down south. Um, now the Battle of Yorktown is an interesting battle because there are so many moving pieces that have to come together. And I have a map here to help me out. Um, this map is not is not a 19th century or not an 18th century map. It's a it's a contemporary map. I think it was first drawn in uh, 1745 um, by the French Navy. And this this actual piece um, uh, is at the Library of the Cincinnati. Um, from the Library of Congress. So it really belongs to the Library of Congress, but they're, they're very kind to let us use it because it's an interest, it's a wonderful map in that it shows the different moving, moving pieces. Um, at this point, Cornwallis uh, is in the south and he has moved his troops over to Gloucester Point here and, and this is Yorktown right here, this is Gloucester Point. And so he's moved his troops in here because it's a wonderful place for Cornwallis's troops to be because it's either where they're going to get more supplies or it's where he can get reinforcements, or if they need to leave for some reason, they can leave very well because they can go right up the York River. And since at this point, the British Navy has been commanding the seas um, in the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution, Cornwallis has no reason to think that this isn't just the most perfect place to situate himself because he has such great access to the water. And he's expecting to get reinforcements, or he's expecting to get supplies, or he's expecting to get orders to move somewhere else via the Navy. This is wonderful. At this point as well, Lafayette has his American troops, because remember Lafayette is part of the American army, he has his American troops in Richmond. So he's already over here, so to speak, if the map extended this far. And so Rochambeau sends, um, or rather Washington sends a letter to, to Lafayette and tells him, keep, keep your troops, keep yourself in this vicinity because you need to keep Cornwallis from, Cornwallis from exiting Virginia via land. So you need to keep him here. And Lafayette, of course, is very happy to oblige. Then, as Washington and Rochambeau are moving down south, there are some very important naval battles that happen in September. Admiral Graves is the admiral in charge of the British fleet. And uh, he is met with the fleet of Admiral de Grasse. And Admiral de Grasse and Graves fight. And it's a naval battle. But it works out much better for the French than the Battle of Quiberon Bay did that I talked about earlier. The French win this battle. Uh, de, Gra de Graves has problems with several of his ships. Uh, this is fought on September 5th. And then just four days later on September 9th, there's a huge storm. And Graves' ships suffer even more in this large storm. Furthermore, de Grasse is getting further help from Barras, who is in charge of all the ships that carried Rochambeau across the ocean to Rhode Island and has all the supplies and all the things that Rochambeau is going to need. So you kind of have a combined fleet of de Grasse and Barras together in the Chesapeake Bay. And you have Graves' very defeated and weather-worn fleet. And so Graves decides that rather than stick around and face two French fleets at the same time, that he's going to sail north to New York and he's going to recover in New York. And this, this, is, this is one of the most essential pieces for the Battle of Yorktown. Because at this point, and I love this map because it, it kind of illustrates how important the Navy is, at this point, Cornwallis, you know, has no recourse to any kind of British fleet whatsoever. The Chesapeake is entirely dominated by the French Navy. And so if Admiral Graves tried to, um, tried to help Cornwallis, he would have to go through the French Navy first. But General, uh, Admiral Graves' fleet can't even try to do that because they're damaged from fighting the French and they're damaged from the storm. And so this, this naval piece is so key for the Battle of Yorktown. And often when we talk about the American Revolution, we think about George Washington and we think about a lot of the land battles because America didn't have a navy at that point. But that's why we are so very happy, thank you France, to have the French Navy fighting um, on, on America's behalf uh, uh, in the American Revolution and for the Battle of Yorktown. 
So now Cornwallis can't go anywhere because he's got Lafayette on one side who's keeping him from leaving via land and he has the French fleet on the other side which keeps, which keeps him from leaving via sea. So Cornwallis is stuck. Now at this point, um, in early October, Rochambeau and Washington have arrived in Virginia and they're going to start to lay siege to Cornwallis stuck in the Yorktown area. Now, Again, another, another opportunity for us to say thank you to France because Washington did not know much about laying siege to anything because that wasn't the way he was taught how to fight, um, and, and, and which, is, which is fine and just dandy. But the French are very good at laying sieges, and if you remember uh, uh, the lecture about the Seven Years' War, uh, the French have actually perfected the art of the siege. They are considered by Europeans to have the best artillery, um, to have the best siege craft of any country in Europe. Uh, Vauban, who was a 17th century French man who worked for Louis XIV, actually came up with the various processes of taking a fortress. And so the French are more than, more than equipped to handle a siege. And in fact, Rochambeau has brought all of the things necessary with him. He has all the appropriate tools, he has all the appropriate weapons, he knows exactly what he's doing. And so many times I've heard Yorktown referred to as Washington's greatest victory. But, and while Washington did many wonderful things for the American Revolution, which I have not addressed, and while Washington was very important for the American Revolution and, and, and showed excellent examples of generalship in other parts of the American Revolution, here, the best thing Washington did was listen to Rochambeau. Because Rochambeau knows how to conduct a proper siege, and he has, his soldiers are trained for it. And really, for the French army to lay siege to Yorktown is on the scale that the French are used to, not that big. Uh, the French have laid siege to, to fortresses for three or four years at times. So Yorktown is something that they are more than, than ready to handle. And just to illustrate um, how adept the French were at sieges, I brought a couple pieces to show you. Um, this is a wonderful piece. Um, it's, it's a part of a book um, called the um, Art Militaire Fortification. There's a huge series on art militaire, military arts, military necessities. And this is the part of the fortification piece. Um, when, during, during the Enlightenment, there was a wonderful man named Diderot who, had, who wrote an encyclopédie. It's kind of the first encyclopedia. And it wasn't just an encyclopedia that we would think of today like Wikipedia, um, which, was, which, which had entries on, on, on uh, countries and animals and things like that. Diderot was also interested in trades. How did people make baskets? What did silversmiths do? How did certain things work? So he also looked at how certain things worked and how certain trades operated. And this included, of course, the, the French army. So he has a wonderful collection um, uh, that, that we have here at the Society of Cincinnati that shows all of the materials necessary for laying a siege. And so I show this to you as just an interesting um, uh, example um, for the tools that were necessary and that the French were very good at using. And you can see things that I've mentioned before about laying sieges, um, such as the baskets, uh, such as the sticks you know, that were put together that would help absorb any kind of uh, cannon fire that were aimed at trenches that the French were digging to get closer and closer to their fortification. And you can see um, elsewhere in this wonderful uh, picture, Let's see if I can find it. They have examples of what the trenches looked like as they were digging them. Um, because, the, and here it is, what the trenches looked like as they were digging them. Because remember I said you, there are trenches and they continue to dig trenches closer and closer and closer to the fortress and that allows them to move their guns closer and closer and closer to the fortress that they're, they're laying siege to. And here you can kind of see kind of the wonky way those trenches work so that they never have just one straight line going forward um, because that would be too easy, e too easy for the, the fortress to destroy with their guns. But it's kind of slowly creeping closer and closer to that fortress. Um, and of course, these are, these are um, sieges on a massive scale. So taking Yorktown is going to be very doable for the French. And again, to illustrate how good the French are at sieges, I have another wonderful piece to show you. This is called Le Jeu de la Guerre, or The War Game. It's actually, it is literally a board game. It's a wonderful board game. Um, it, was, it was made in 1750 um, uh, for a, a French noble officer. And you, you, start, um, you start down here at the first square here, and you kind of go, you move your piece kind of in this pattern around the edges, and then you move closer and closer in until this is the final square where you, the, the French officer who has performed very well in battle, gets, gets an award from the king. Um, and so this kind of illustrates and has, and has all the different, each square is a different situation that French officers would have to face if they were at war. And uh, there's one in particular I'd like to bring to your attention, and it's this one. It's number 36. It's the siege. And if you happen to land on this square, the siege, you would have to give up so many of your, your little tokens, and you'd have to wait six turns before you got to go again, because sieges took a long time. 
But once you had waited your six turns and other people had had a chance to move elsewhere around the board, you would get to skip all the way up to here, which is square number 49, which is very close to your goal of getting a medal from the king. And this is kind of emblematic of how sieges worked for the French, because if they were going to lay siege to something, it took a long time and it was expensive, but they almost always won. It was, it was all but, unless, unless the other fortress was particularly well armed and had, had a way to get supplies to it, um, and your forces were particularly ill prepared to lay siege to that fortress, you should be able to take it. Um, and so this again is just an, another illustration of how uh, ready the French were to lay siege to something um, and how, how accustomed they were to it. So the French begin to lay siege at Yorktown, and after that, in pretty quick succession, they're able to take Yorktown. Um, and I'll just, just uh, point out a, a, a few key dates here. Um, on October 6th, the French started digging trenches, which is the first step. And of course, digging trenches is a dangerous job. You could be blown, be blown up to smithereens if a cannonball hits you, but they got, they got their trenches started. Um, on October 10th, they, they had enough guns in place that they could start shelling Yorktown. So it only took them about four days to bring in the big guns. Um, on October 12th, they had shelled the fortress enough to the point where they felt comfortable advancing their trenches even closer to the, to, to the fortress at Yorktown, closer to the British at Yorktown. Um, and so they, they start shelling again. On October 14th, there's a very important battle um, at eight, eight o'clock at night in which uh, a very elite group of French soldiers who are, who are light troops um, and who are, who are used to fighting in very close quarters um, are sent under the command of Viomnel uh, uh, to go and take readouts nine and 10. And these are just outlying posts that the British have that are gonna to try to stop the French advance. Uh, and they are joined um, uh, they are joined by Lafayette and his American troops. And the two of them fight together, they combine their forces, and this is one of the very few times where you see the French and the Americans actually fighting alongside each other. They fight together, and the French sustain, sustain about 25% casualties, the Americans sustain about the same, but the British sustain about a third of their troops' casualties at readouts 9 and 10. And so the French are able to take that, and they get even closer um, uh, to Cornwallis. Uh, let's see, and then on the 16th of October, the British perform a counterattack, so they, they send some of their troops out to try to take out as many guns as possible, because if the French army doesn't have guns anymore, large artillery pieces anymore that they can use to batter Yorktown, then they're gonna have to retreat and go get more guns, and maybe Cornwallis will have a chance to escape. Unfortunately, the counter, well, unfortunately for Cornwallis, the counterattack doesn't work very, very well, and the British are able to spike about four guns, um, but then the French army is able to chase them off again. And so then, on the 17th, now that he's, he's, his, his resources are fairly exhausted, Cornwallis is going to ask for surrender terms. Um, and Cornwallis, is, as, as legend has it, was too sick um, at the time uh, to go and actually surrender himself to George Washington, but he, he puts forth his surrender terms. He's got about two hours to get them together. He, so he submits them, um, and es essentially he's going to have to surrender all of his troops. He's going to have to surrender with his flags sheathed so he can't be flying his colors when he surrenders, and that's kind of an insult to the British, but the British made the Americans surrender in the same way, so George Washington is gonna say, okay, an eye for an eye, you have to sheathe your colors too. Um, and when Cornwallis sends his, um, his second in command uh, to go surrender Cornwallis' sword, the second in command looks around, who do I give this to? And of course he marches right up to Rochambeau, who is of course the man who arranged the siege. And Rochambeau, because he is subordinate to General Washington, turns it over to Washington. And Washington, who refuses to accept it, uh, uh, allows General Lincoln to accept it on his behalf. And hooray, Yorktown has surrendered. Now on the scale of really large important battles, this is nothing on the scale of, say, the Battle of Quebec that I talked about earlier. It's a siege that happens very quickly, um, uh, and yet at the same time, it's incredibly decisive. And Washington, during most of the American Revolution, had avoided very decisive movements because Washington's primary strategy was to keep his army intact. He didn't have very much of an army, he didn't have a very well-trained army or a very well-disciplined army, but if he could keep his army intact, then he would not be able to surrender to the British. And the idea was just to keep the British fighting and fighting and fighting until they got so tired that they had had enough and were gonna wash their hands of it. And of course, along the way, Washington had a lot of help from uh, different state militias. But here, this is, this is the big decisive action of the, Ameri of, of the American Revolution. And of course, they're able to do it because of the, 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 the French. Um, and just to kind of give you an idea about how decisive this is, when Cornwallis surrendered, he surrendered 8,000 British troops. And 8,000 British troops was 25% of the troops in America at the time. 
Now, it might not strike you, and it didn't necess necessarily strike Washington or Rochambeau at the time that this was going to be the last battle of the American Revolution. But uh, even though there were 25 percent or even though there were 75% of the troops left in North America, um, for England, this kind of signaled the beginning of the end. And I'll just give you a couple of dates to show how the Battle of Yorktown influenced decisions in England to continue the war, or rather not continue the war. So the Battle of Yorktown is won on the 17th of October, 1781. News travels slowly in the 18th century, especially if you're an ocean away. So England doesn't find out about the Battle of Yorktown until November 25th, 1781. So a little over a month later. A few days after they find out about the Battle of Yorktown, um, England decides on the 8th of December to, to no longer send any more troops to America. They are no longer going to be sending troops to America. They, are, they, they, have, they have cut off uh, the idea of, of involving more British troops in this, in this debacle. Shortly after that, on the 17th of February in 1782, um, the, the House of Commons votes to end the war. So the House of Commons is not all of England, but the House of Commons votes to end the war. And shortly after then, at the 4th of March, um, they actually vote something that says, if you try to pursue this war against the Americans, you will be condemned for treason. So that's very quick. So it's very quick, just a couple of months between the end of the Battle of Yorktown and the idea that if you continue trying to fight this war, we will accuse you of treason. So the Battle of Yorktown really is what convinced um, the British that they were going to have to withdraw. And again, there's a lot to thank, um, uh, uh, it, there's, a, there's a lot to thank um, the French for all of this. And the French alliance with America is largely, we like to focus on the Battle of Yorktown. And there's good reason why, because the French were good at sieges, and they had troops, and they had a navy, which was so important. Um, but in allying with America, the French didn't just provide troops, and they didn't just provide money, but they provided a certain amount of legitimacy for this, this burgeoning nation. Um, it was important for the United States, this new United States, if it was going to succeed, not just to be recognized as no longer part of Britain, but to be recognized as a country in its own right. And the fact that the French allied with it, and when the, when the French signed the Treaty of Alliance, they actually referred to these colonies as the United States. Um, it, helped, it, helped the, uh, it helped the Americans have a certain amount of clout um, with other countries in Europe. It was going to help them further establish themselves as an independent nation that wasn't tied to Britain or anything else. And not only was it no longer tied to Britain, but it was a, a, a united nation in its own right. It wasn't just scattered colonies that had been left by its mother country. So again, we have a lot to thank France for this. Usually when I, usually when I teach the Battle of Yorktown, or if I'm teaching in the month of October and we happen to fall on the date of the Battle of Yorktown, I make all of my students say, thank you, France. <laughs> and they usually roll their eyes at me and say, Thank you, France. <laughs> and then someone is someone is always makes some kind of smarmy remark about World War II, um, at which point I usually remind them that we cannot say you're welcome to the French for World War II because none of us were alive then, frankly, at least none of the people who are usually found in my classroom. Um, but the reason, but we still can't thank the French for the Battle of Yorktown because without the Battle of Yorktown, who knows if and when the British would have withdrawn. So thank you, France. Um, I'd also like to take an opportunity to show some more pictures related to the Battle of Yorktown. This oh, is very heavy. Oof. This is a, uh, actually a 19th century drawing trying to depict uh, the Battle of Yorktown. And again, many of the of like larger portraits I'm showing you, of course, are not presenting an actual scene, but are trying to present kind of an overall image of what happened during the Battle of Yorktown. And I really like this image because you can see um, here, this man right here is George Washington. Um, and you can kind of see he's looking over his left shoulder and he's kind of gesturing with his hand. And here is Rochambeau. And Rochambeau is standing kind of in front of General Washington. Rochambeau is standing kind of, is standing in front of General Washington in this, um, in this picture and is gesturing outward, which gives the impression that Rochambeau is the one running the battle and, Washambeau, and um, Washington is allowing him to do it. And so I like this image because I, I think it kind of presents um, kind of a, 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 a brief image which gives an idea of exactly who did what um, at the Battle of Yorktown. Now, as much as I often like to say, thank you, France. Um, the Battle of Yorktown also was a very good thing for France. Um, they didn't just lose some soldiers in the Battle of Yorktown and um, put their navy at risk. Um, but for the French, this was also a very large victory that they liked to talk about as well. And I'm going to come over here. 
and show this picture, which is of Lafayette. And this is Lafayette standing next to his horse, and he actually had an aide who was an um, uh, 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 African-American with him. And here he is pointing to the Battle of Yorktown with his left hand. And he's got a very big smile on his face because he's very happy because Lafayette played an important role in the Battle of Yorktown as well. And remember that France, this is the first conflict that France is participating in since they lost the Seven Years' War in 1763. And you remember that there were many uh, young officers who wanted to volunteer for the American army so that they could gain prestige and they could have a chance to show themselves off in battle. And here, this was a, a, a a, a victory that the French army could claim, and it's their first victory since they lost terribly during the Seven Years' War. And so it's one that they also were very proud of. And in addition, the American army, I'm gonna put this down. In addition, the American army had obtained a certain elite status in France. And that might seem odd to us because most of us know that the American army was not bad, all things considered, but the American army wasn't a highly disciplined, polished European army like what the French are used to. But that actually kind of helped um, uh, uh, the French conceive of the American army. And the American army was um, often sometimes poorly put together. Uh, often the, the troops were not well trained or were not interested in being well trained. Often the officers did not have any kind of experience um, uh, serving in an army beforehand. But the French thought this was a really interesting and intriguing experiment. Because the French army had just lost the Seven Years' War, many French officers were open to other ideas about how to approach organizing their army. And so they paid particular attention when they saw something that resembled a citizen army cropping up in America. And of course, because they were, they were very interested to see the citizen army succeed, um, they, they looked at it in such a rosy colored light that they missed a lot of the problems that you have with the citizen army, or at least a lot of the problems that General Washington has with, had with his army. But the American army in French literature and in French newspapers and in French poetry and in French songs and in French images were often presented as this wonderful patriotic group of hardy people who had been uh, uh, raised from infancy to fight for their beloved patrie, their beloved homeland, and who will stop at nothing for independence and liberty. And while this image is not entirely correct, and it's actually quite incorrect in some ways, um, the French loved this image, and so they kind of projected it on the American army, and they portrayed the American army as a very hardy, masculine army. And so it helped the French army in some ways by, pre by presenting their army as being a help to this very masculine army. It made the French army even, even greater. That look, even this wonderful masculine citizen army needs our help, and so we will go and we will help this strong masculine army by being even cooler than they are and winning the Battle of Yorktown. Uh, and in fact, it was very, um, the, the, the French were also very enamored with the idea of General Washington and the image of this, this, this uh, uh, farmer who had left his farm to go and fight for his patrie and, and to die if necessary for patriotic reasons and things like that. And the French loved this idea of General Washington. They saw him as kind of a modern day uh, a Roman Cincinnatus figure. And so the play, French playwrights especially love to have scenes where the French army and the American army is together and George Washington praises the French army because again, it, it, it helped the French army kind of revive itself um, after a difficult loss a few years ago. And there's one wonderful scene where the French army and the American army are, are marching towards each other on a hill and they're going to meet each other for the first time. And of course this never happened, um, but French playwrights like to think that this might have happened. And again, they're, they're not necessarily trying to represent exactly what is, but what they would like to see, or they're trying to you know, put together a nice metaphor, a nice picture. And so the French army and the American army march up and they meet each other and they stand and they look at each other. And General Washington says, oh, only you, the French, are capable of such wondrous deeds. And he tells his, French sol his, his American soldiers to go embrace your French counterparts as friends of liberty. And he says, oh, I am so glad that the French army has come to liberate us. And it's a very sentimental scene, and no, it never ever happened. But the French really liked this idea that they were tying themselves to a very patriotic American force. Uh, and, and, and of course, obviously, it, it uh, helped the Americans very much as well. And the two armies embrace, and they're very happy. 
Now, when the French army was in North America, there was usually very little action or interaction between the French and the American armies. In fact, uh, Rochambeau and Washington both agreed that it would be best if the armies were kept entirely separate. So often people will ask me questions like, well, how much influence did the French army get from the American army as far as hanging out together, talking about revolution and talking about freedom? And we all know that the French Revolution is not too far off on the horizon in the beginning of the 1780s. It's less than a decade away. So, you know, is there any kind of revolutionary transfer as these two armies meet and meld and hug and kiss and drink together and all these things, which they never did. Um, and there is very little interaction between the two armies, so there's very little uh, influence from one army to the next. Uh, however, there was one study done uh, by a man named Forrest MacDonald back in the 50s, and he looked at, he tried to study French soldiers who are very hard to study because they left us very little written records. And so, th and, and we, all we have is some officers' accounts of them, but the officers were not usually particularly interested in how their troops felt deeply about things. Um, so he looked at, the, at, at, this, at these French troops, and he tried to see when they went back to France where they went, and he plotted out exactly which French soldiers went to which province in France. And then he did a, dif a different study where he looked at which provinces in France experienced the most violence during the French Revolution. And he found that those, that those two studies corresponded with each other. So he, draw, he drew the conclusion that French soldiers returning from the American Revolution felt some kind of American revolutionary fervor and caused great violence during the French Revolution as they were fighting uh, to end what he called economic feudalism in their own areas. And they all wanted their own little farms. They all wanted to be small New England farmers or something like that. Uh, this is a nice idea and it was an interesting study and it's one of the few ways you can actually try to understand um, the French soldier. Uh, at least as far as our methods will carry us today. But most historians look at that and think, what an interesting correlation. But there are many reasons for this interesting correlation. So it's, you, you, you can't necessarily pin um, violence in the French Revolution on the American Revolution, which happened almost a decade um, earlier. So I get that question a lot, and, and, and there's the answer for that. Aha. All right. So. What I'd like to talk about next, and when I move on to this next, the, this, this next lecture, is really focus on what is the importance of the American Revolution for France. Because for the past three lectures, I've talked about France and North America and how France has affected North America. And you see that France has affected North America in several ways, um, uh, especially in, as far as American Revolution happening um, favorably uh, for the United States, which really, frankly, the America would not be free without the French. Um, from the very beginning, the French were able to supply money, uniforms, arms, uh, through rather secretive means, if necessary, while the French stood back and waited and watched to see how well the Americans would do. And then after the Battle of Saratoga, the French actually promised uh, troops. And after, after trying to bring troops with Destang, they finally succeeded in getting troops over with Rochambeau. And when Rochambeau and Washington were able to combine their forces with de Grasse and with Barat, they get the Battle of Yorktown, which is the decisive battle of the American Revolution and which allows America to finally be independent from Britain.